<laughs> nice. Except we have no David yet. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. How are you doing there with your, your lovely consoles behind you that our audio folks can't see, but they're lovely. Rocking and I'm rolling. Yes, you are. And I am now recording my audio, so I don't forget later. Is that, that one console on my right, your left, is that one still kicking your butt? Oh, Gravatar? Yeah, I haven't even hit 30,000 points on it. It's embarrassing. It is so hard. It is so crazy, crazy hard. Are there 8-bit... Hey, David's back. Hey! Are there, Are there 8 bit implementations for that game? For oh, Gravatar? sure, yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch. There's a, there's a fairly decent Atari 2600 version. Oh, nice. Not, um, not Vector, obviously, but... Mm -hmm. It's just oh, it's a really hard game. That's right. That's a vector game. Yeah. Love it. But it looks... So it's a color vector game. Yeah, it's a big, bright color XY monitor. Just totally... That's the main reason I wanted it. Where it's, it's such a different experience playing it on that monitor than in any emulator. Like when you play it on a raster screen, it's just... It's so much more vivid and scintillating when you, when you play it on the actual monitor. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. I love it. Kind of like Battlezone with the vector look. I love so Battlezone. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. Exact same sort of thing. Yeah, Battlezone was the same sort of thing, also an XY monitor. So it just, it's, it, it's got this great booming vase, uh, bass, too. So it just, it just like shakes the condo when I play this thing. <laughs> so I'm sure my neighbors are all always aware. They're like, oh, Carrington's playing Gravatar again. Yep. Luckily, it'll only last 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, yes. So, David, how's your audio? Can we hear you? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. We okay? All right, yeah. And my side of things is a little bit scratchy, but it's just it'll so be all right. And I'm in, the, I'm in the forums now, so I just tried it in Safari, and it was blocking, I guess, the plug-in. By the way. Yeah, the, I'm going to do just Chrome this time. We'll see if it works. The I Flash guess. plugin? Still not a fan of these I guess things. so, or is it Java? One of the two. Oh, uh, Flash. Yeah, Java keeps getting... Yeah. They keep Java just keeps getting that. hammered. Yeah. Man, those guys at Oracle, they need to stop sitting on their thumb. and. It's tough when you have a programming language that can execute code on somebody else's computer. It's tough to keep that safe. Yep. I know I'm hacking the hell out of the two of you right now. Oh, David, you're cold. Oh, 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 oh. So, David, shall we do our little syncy thing? Oh, that yes. You want? So when you edit Thank there? you. Yep, so I'll, I'll lead that off, if you guys don't mind. So, all right, ready to go? Ready. Oh, let me start recording. Hold on. <laughs> there, I'm recording. All right, nice. good. Four, three, two, two one, one, Mark. Mark. Close enough. Yeah, I'll get it. I always listen through a couple of times. And also, I'll make sure to the, get rid of the old commercials this time when I put in the new ones. That's what happened last time for anybody right. yeah, we that got the early show. No worries. Yeah, so sorry for the subscribers that had to download more than once. Had to push out a change. Yeah, because you know what happened was the, the, the previous show was way shorter. It was a real quick show for us, like 48 minutes off the top of my head. And then this, the last one was like an hour and 15 or something. So Who was the host I just of the last completely one? missed where the commercials were. Huh? Who was the host of the last one? Me? Maybe. Probably. Was it? If you're the host, it's always a long show. <laughs> <laughs> was it me? I don't, you know. I, don't I think, I, I, think anyway. I hosted the, I, the last Yeah, I, I think, think you did. I think, uh, I, think, uh, I think it was Earl, actually. I think it was you, Carrington. That's why, you know, I... I I'm really the host this time. this time. No, he's, he's the host with the most. <laughs> I'm going to keep you in line. I really... <laughs> That's right. Hey, Crack the whip, show. Mr. C. 15. <laughs> That'll be the day. And I see visitors. Uh, seven people have jumped into the chat. Hello, people. Hi, Hi, everyone. Oh, Randall's with us. And Eric. Nice. We have a little announcement from uh, for Ran Randy today. Do we? Yeah. I haven't actually looked over our show notes. I'm going to kind of wing it as I go. You should do that. <laughs> we have, <laughs> we have show things. notes? <laughs> I feel no need. I've got my bits memorized. I'm not really that interested in your bits. <laughs> so shall we begin the show? I think we should. And, you know, uh, yeah, I'll say my uh, also hello to our live viewers. Thanks for stopping by and... Mm -hmm. Hanging out in our neighborhood. Okay, let's do it. Here we go. This is the Retro Computing Roundtable, episode 45, recorded Sunday, February 17th, 2013. Oh, that 
future. Woo. I may not be a Carrington Vanston, but I play one on TV. And I'm also going to play host for this episode. And scooched up to the round table with me are the usual scoochers, David Grealish and Earl Evans. Hello, scoochers. Hey there. Hey, hey. How are you guys doing? Good. I'm doing very good today. I'll answer up. <laughs> he, he had to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm doing great today. Having a really a beautiful day outside. So the sun came back out. A little weather chat, you know. Um, so it's been been inside most of the day, but it's a really nice day out. I'm a pale nerd, so for me it's always a beautiful day inside. <laughs> yeah, I got the hacker's tan too. What about you, Earl? I'm doing exceptionally <laughs> well today. I'm very, very uh, alert, and you know, I, it's it's almost like I'm I'm really living here. So, <laughs> almost. <laughs> well, we are going to try out something in this show that uh, David came up with and introduced in the last episode, and we'll see if uh, we can sort of find our way to how to integrate this. And it's the hosts' topic. The idea is that in in addition to the regular news shows, we're going to have a topic of interest that we sort of discuss. Um, something about a computer, something about software, that sort of thing. Um, we're sort of finding finding our, our footwork in this. And I have decided as the host that my host topic that we're going to discuss now is going to be our first computers versus our real first computers. Here's what I mean. For me, my actual first quote-unquote computer would be an Altair 8800. I had that as a partially assembled beast that I then put together and played with. And it was great, and it was awesome. It was also something I could barely do anything with. No way to save anything, it, but it introduced me to the idea of having a computer. That was great. I then had, I think, a Heath kit. I think I had a Kim one. I had a couple of other computers, and I started to get vague on what order. But then I had the Apple II Plus. And for me, that was the real first computer I had, something I could understand, something I could really use, something I fell in love with. And it's because of the Apple II Plus that I became an actual computer user, I became a programmer, I became the nerd that I am today. So for me, there was a real difference between the actual first, literally the first computer I had, but then the computer I think of as my spiritual first computer. And I'd like to know if it's the same thing with you guys. So I'd like to ask you both, what was your actual physical first, the literal first computer you ever had or had access to? And then what would you consider the, the spiritual first one, the one that got you hooked, the one that is your you know, emotional first? So David, let's start with you. What was your very, very first computer? Well, my story's similar to yours, um, though you got started sooner than I. Because so I'm my old. First, <laughs> my first computer was a Commodore 64. And, um, and it was actually a computer I really wanted, and, and I was a very poor college student, and it couldn't, couldn't oh, even so buy not until college. <laughs> yeah, so. Oh, really? Wow. So you didn't have a computer until college? Like, not even no, not right. in your house, no, no. with your family or anything? No. Okay. Well, I'm a little older than you, actually. <laughs> and so the dinosaurs, as they roam the earth. <laughs> but um, I actually had a very, a very nice girlfriend that bought me a Commodore 64 for my birthday. You should still be with her. 1985, <laughs> so kind of late even with the Commodore 64, not too late with the Commodore 64, but all I ever had was uh, the Commodore 64, nothing else. So I had it connected to a television set, and uh, and that's all I could do was like do some real basic programming and leave it on for days at a time to play around Okay, so with similar it. like me with the, the yeah. Altair, where I didn't have a means of saving, I didn't right. have anything. Like you were in I, the same position. And I would have liked to have done more with it, and it could have become my, my first platform, if you will, but... Um, but a real quick story then is, uh, so I was on my own. I was an adult at that time. And for one time in my entire life, I had my own apartment shortly after that, my own little one-bedroom apartment. And I had just moved in, hadn't lived there two weeks, and had very little furniture. And I had my little 13-inch color TV on the floor and my Commodore 64, and I was messing with it. And I had like a glass sliding door, and I didn't have any curtains on it. And like a dummy, I went to work. I was a waiter and worked at night. I left it on. I should have just turned the TV off, right? I don't know why, but I left it on so it's glowing, and my and my neighbors have this big party. So I come home like I worked at Bennigan's, if you guys remember that. I came home like at two o'clock in the morning, and they, someone smashed in my glass sliding door, and took two of my most you know only valuable things I really owned. The other my car, I guess, was the computer and the, the TV. Oh, that's awful. So yeah, so that was pretty sad. But anyway, shortly after that, I went to work for a uh, a computer store, and that's where I discovered the the Macintosh. And so from that point on, I was like all about. I'm only going to own a Macintosh, or it was even more expensive. So it wasn't until December 1989. It wasn't a real Mac, was it? I think it was a right. Mac or it was a Lisa. 
Yep, from Sunry Marketing. So it was a new old stock Lisa that they had upgraded to, to where it was essentially a Mac Plus. So that was December 1989, and, and it was cheaper than what a Mac Plus was. So that's why I went for it. Mm -hmm. So it was it was one thousand and ninety nine dollars. So. so you would say that the Commodore 64 was your literal first computer, but the Macintosh platform was really your sort of emotional first one. Oh yeah, and that machine, okay. I um, and you know, I used a credit card to buy it, and I needed to also make me some money. So that's where I first got into desktop publishing, and I used to do resumes for people and stuff like that, and earn money back. For so. me, it was the same sort of thing. The reason I wanted to get into computers and how I funded my first purchases was at the time the taxes had changed here in Canada, and people were having a lot of trouble changing their. Um, uh, cash registers. And oh, so really? I walked up and down Young Street. I had a budget that I needed to buy my computer. So I walked up and down Young Street as this young kid. But it was a time where everybody thought, oh, young kids, therefore are computer whizzes, whatever. Nobody really understood anything. So they had these all programmable cash registers. And I walked in with a fake little, well, fake, but printed business card just saying that, you know, I'm in the business of making that. I had no idea how to do it. I just knew it needed to be changed. And I took yeah. $100 deposits. And it was a $200 service that I would change over their cash register. I took $100 deposit and schedule the time for me or one of the other technicians to come back. Really? And I did that until I had enough $100 deposits to buy myself the computer I wanted. And I said, okay, now I guess I better learn cash register. And then you skipped town. <laughs> and, then, and then I went back and did it all again and thought, oh my god. And that was it. I got into the idea of, holy crap, people will pay you to do stuff like this. And then I just became a, a you know, an independent programmer and stuff going, the, I can actually sell this as a service. Not doing cash registers anymore, but, but indie programming and stuff. So that's how I got yeah. into it. So what about you? That's cool. What, what would you consider, what was your, let's start with, what was your first actual computer that you or your family would have had? Now, are we talking about computers at home or computers we had access to? Anything because, you want. Because the first microcomputer that I had access to was at my middle school, which at the time we called junior high, and that was an Apple II. It was uh, one of the original Apple IIs. Oh, and not a plus for anything, an actual Apple II. Uh, the situation as I remember it was that our school could submit these Fortran batch jobs to the mainframe downtown. It would take two days to get your program turned around and all of that wasn't very interactive. Our, uh, obviously, our instructor owned an Apple II of his own and decided that he wanted to bring it in for the enterprising computer students in his class to use and learn on, which I thought was just a fantastic uh, show of commitment to his students. So he brought in his Apple II and we learned how to program on it. And when I saw it and I, you know, found out, wow, this is a computer and you can actually sit down and do things on it. You don't have to wait, you know, for your stuff to turn around. It was like love at first sight. So, but this was a limited scenario in many ways. We didn't have a disk drive. It was just cassette storage. The cassette storage wasn't all that reliable, so you're always biting your fingernails wondering if your program was going to get lost. Um, and obviously, I didn't have access to it at home or anything like that. Um, the first computer that I had access at home was when I went to work for a computer store called HW Computers, and one of their policies was uh, if you're a salesperson there, they would let you take home your choice of the models that they had in stock so that you could learn about and become expert wow, in pretty one nice. of the systems. Oh, that's a good benefit. Just, yeah, great benefit. That's a reason to take the job. <laughs> no kidding, huh? Um, so the one that I chose was an Atari 800 um, and an 810 disk drive and uh, you know, nice AMDEC color monitor. And that's really what I feel like is my first computer that I could do anything practical with because I had a disk drive. I could uh, load and save my programs. I had access to the various software packages that we had for demo purposes at the store and that, you know, that that's probably what I would think of as my first home computer. It wasn't the first one I owned, but it was the first one that I could really grapple with. And what was the first computer you actually owned, like when you actually purchased one? That was a VIC-20. Got it on the employee discount. Uh, it was cheap already, and when you buy it on the discount, it's even cheaper. And that was the first one that I had uh, any kind of ownership of. So why'd you go for the VIC rather than sticking with the Atari? Um, That's what I was going to ask. Price. Well, and, and it would have been a good question, David. Um, <laughs> price was definitely a factor. Uh, even with the, the discounts that we had as employees, a full Atari system would have been out of my budget at the time. The second mm -hmm. thing is is that I had some affinity 
for the Commodore systems because in high school, uh, and I think I've talked about this before, I used the Commodore PET with the Chiclet keyboard because nobody else wanted to mess with that Chiclet keyboard. They hated it. But I'm thinking this is free computer time and I was voraciously hungry for computer time. So I'd already kind of had some exposure to Commodore and the funny graphics keys and all that kind of thing. So when the VIC-20 came out and I looked at it, I was like, oh, wow, I, I know this. I'm familiar with this. This feels good. So it was a combination of the two things. I, I think mostly price, though. A friend of mine, Eric, he and I had started the local Commodore club there in L.A., and the uh, he'd come to me just, his eyes were glowing one day practically, and he said, there's a computer we can afford now. We can actually buy this thing. I was like, what, what, what is it? And he told me all about the VIC-20. Got me excited about it, too. It's amazing how that still is the case today. I mean, computers are expensive things, but you hear less or at least fewer stories about that sort of idea, like somebody just gets amazed at the idea that, oh my gosh, there is now a system of some sort that I can actually have. Because with the, with the, especially with things like the iPad and that kind of stuff nowadays, there's computers that range huge price ranges and use systems. You can always pick up a computer that's five years old and get it yep. quite cheap. So, but there wasn't, you know, the computer that was five years old if you were shopping for something in 1980. Yeah. And that's funny you bring up the iPad because that's what I was just thinking is, um, and, you know, I just caught a commercial the first time I ever saw, uh, have you guys seen this new commercial by Amazon where now they uh, just barely caught it. I think we we're in a restaurant maybe or something and they show the iPad and they show its display and then they show the Kindle Fire and its display and they're showing you how, oh, see, it's not much different, right? And they show a few things like that. Then ultimately the point is they show four ninety nine, two ninety nine on the Kindle Fire. And I'm like, you know what, that, that pretty much says it all right there. That's good. That's pretty smart advertising on their part. I mean, sure, absolutely. Most, mm -hmm. most people know part. that, but but yeah, I wonder if the same thing's going on with uh, you know tablets. But I that think was so, thing. and there's a huge difference. I mean, like you could get a, a Nexus Seven, which has become a, a really popular tablet mm -hmm. for the two hundred dollar price range, mm -hmm. and yeah. that's just a gigantic you know chasm between people who can afford two hundred for a tablet and yeah. people who can five hundred drop five bills five or up. Right. But, sure. But Earl, sure. The same thing for me was, um, yeah, I worked at an Apple dealer, and even at a discount, uh, I have this written down like in my my book and my story. But so I think I'm remembering correctly. But I think it was eighteen hundred dollars for a Mac Plus. And, and, and come on, you could you have to have a hard drive. Even in 1989, it'd be ridiculous not to have a hard drive, right? So it was like eighteen hundred bucks for the Mac Plus with the hard drive under it, twenty uh, megabyte, you know, at a discount. And I had no hope of affording that. So I was able to get my Lisa for $1,100. That was huge, you know, the, the difference. Yep. So. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, I find, I find it an interesting topic because I've talked to, to a lot of people. I'm always interested in somebody's first computer and whether mm -hmm. that computer is still sort of their platform of choice. The way that I'm a complete Apple zealot. And I, I can totally trace that back to that first Apple II Plus I had. And well, it I was think it's true I for know, all my three fourth of us. computer. Um, I guess so, yeah. Like, it definitely is the case for me that that, that was the computer that I f truly fell in love with. I loved yeah. computers as in general. I had loved access to computers I had at home, the ones that I had at school, like, like Earl. I also had access to a pet with a terrible chiclet keyboard in, in I think, that, I guess that was junior high or something. But it was my, it was my Apple II Plus, which was my first mm -hmm. actual, you know, real computer that, that I owned. That one was due my parents' money partially. And um, just fell in love with the platform <laughs> in a way that I hadn't fallen in love with the other ones specifically. I was just more in love with computers in general. But it was the Apple that turned me, and then I became that whole, you know, that guy that I am, to, the zealot that I am today. <laughs> to that. I remain. So, but, but I've I, always... That's why I became... I've, yeah, it's just Sorry, I've always thought of it as there's a difference between the the actual first computer and then yeah. my you know my real love first computer and and there was a difference. So uh, for me, I just want, interested to see if it was the same for you guys. Well, that's anyway, true. We you, should, Earl, I'm, I'm, because you're a com big commoner guy, I think at heart, Earl is, and I'm I'm definitely a Mac person at heart. Mm -hmm. That's my first love or whatever. And I have love for like before the show, before we started recording, Earl and I were talking about, in fact, the Atari 800, and um, mm -hmm. I was talking about the form factor for that. And I adore. I've always had this crazy, crazy warmth in my heart for the Atari 800, which is bizarre since it's a computer I have barely used at all. <laughs> but it's just something about the form factor for that that I just just draws me, and I'm sure that I will one day spend a lot of time on that platform. But for me, it's it's been Apple all the way since those that 
early two plus days. So anyway, that that was our host topic. Um, now let's get into some news, guys. It's time for news. The news is new, and David is going to kick us off. David, you're going to kick us off with Project Genesis, which, if I recall, is something out of a Star Trek movie. <laughs> yeah, wasn't it the? Was it called the Genesis uh, device? Maybe something like that. So is that is that now real? Should I be worried? Are you brought, terraforming brought the, the Earth back to life? And, right. uh, and then it spawned um, Star Trek Three, I think. And really, so, really ticked off the Klingons. So I'd be careful if I were you. Everything ticks off the Klingons. Well, that's um, true. My daughter, who's become a huge, has become a huge Star Trek fans, like yelling at me from the living room. <laughs> about, something about no dad because he's hearing what I'm saying. I'm on the air, hun. <laughs> um, <laughs> Basically, um, this came out, I think, on the same day we did the show, two weeks ago is what it says. So just real quick, is um, Project Genesis is a little short film. How long is it? it is, I think it's like a little over six minutes. Have both of you guys seen this? No. Oh, watch it. It's, it's, it's very entertaining. It's very cool. So it's okay, in well, a we'll nutshell. Minutes after this break. <laughs> it's, it's about um, you know, Macintoshes as people, essentially, and sure, the, we had Apple, about Apple this, computers. Uh, we had talked about this before. Um, I think we saw a ago. promo for yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. So he released it, and um, and it's it's well done. It's a, it's a very nice little film, and um, and so basically, Apple computers, you know, created man. I'll, that's all I need to say about it. No spoilers, anything. So go watch it. Link, link. In the I show believe there. that's revisionist history. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it is. Yes. <laughs> well, Guy so, Kawasaki uh, had that thing. The uh, wasn't it him? The Macintosh Bible? Isn't that written by him? Oh, um, so he. He did the way, the Macintosh way. Oh, yeah. Stuff. So there was something called the Macintosh Bible. So maybe in that, yeah. you know, and in the beginning, Macintosh created man. <laughs> like, let there be electricity. So, um, Earl, Seems next like up I will be up you. Here. And David, maybe while Earl talks to us about the SBC 6120, you can check, take a glance into the comments to see if anybody else has been discussing their first computers and stuff. I'd be interested to see what the commenters have to say about that. But, Earl, first up, what about you? What is this SBC 6120, that whole bunch of letters and digits? Is it a it, license plate? That's my it, guess. It, it is many numbers and, and letters, isn't it? But actually, it's also a very fun project put together by uh, Spare Time Gizmos. And uh, this, this uh, particular kit has been around for quite a long time. And... Uh, they're very popular. When they come out, they sell out really fast. And there was a question mark whether or not this kit would ever be available again. And it turns out that the person who created it said, hey, I've got some of these parts still available, and I'm going to do another run. So he did a <laughs> Kickstarter, and uh, they're $600 a piece. So in terms of the kit, uh, wh where this would fit into you know, economically, this is uh, among the more expensive kits. But what, so first let me tell you what it is. It is a single board computer implementation of the DEC PDP-8. It's a replica sort of kit. It's based on the Harris, I think it's the HD 6120 chip, mm -hmm. which was a PDP-8 on a chip. And you take that chip and you build a computer around it, a single board computer. It also comes with this really nicely laid out front panel with the LED blinking lights and the rocker switches. Think IMSI, but miniaturized. Right, and it's gorgeous yeah. looking. It Very really is looking. beautiful, and the coloring reminiscent of the deck equipment at mm -hmm. that time. So I've actually seen one of these in person at the Seattle Club meeting, loved it, thought it was a, a gorgeous computer. Steve Gibson of the Security Now podcast is very fond of these, has a couple of them showing in the background whenever he does his podcast. And apparently there have been hundreds of these that have been made over time. And so again, the question mark was, would there ever be another run? So there was, it was a Kickstarter project. It got funded well ahead of schedule. Mm -hmm. All 30 of them got bought up and this, apparently, because of the parts uh, availability, this is it. This is the last batch. That well, we'll, we'll see. link to the, the Kickstarter, and it did get funding, and it has six days to go. You're still SOL because there were just 30 available, and all 30 have been taken. That's right. There were 30. The 30 are gone, uh, which, you know, I, I think is neat, and I'm excited. I hope that some of the people who purchased them will blog about their construction mm -hmm. experience and that w because different people have mounted these slightly differently and have done different things with them. Uh, Steve Gibson, the guy I referenced, even did a little uh, 
bit of hacking on the boot firmware so that he could have some programs that ran right when you turn it on so that you could do some different dances with the LEDs using the toggle switches and that kind of thing. So nice. it, it just looks really neat and for PDP. And it is about the mounting, like like you say, because it's yeah. a single board and the FP stands for front, front panel. So it really is a board on this front panel and that's the, the combination. The board works on its own too, but he said that nobody ever buys it without the front panel. But then that's all you have. Like just, so you have to put it in or mount it on some sort of case or something. And in the same way that what differentiates the various Apple ones, it's, it's sort of like what kind of case you put it in, like what you do from there. Do you make something out of wood or mount it? So it'll be really interesting to see what people do with there. So they assemble this to get it working. What do you do? Do you mount it on the wall? Do you make a case? Do you put it in something else? I really hope that the people that did this will blog about it. I'd, I'd love it to be documented. Yep. I actually thought it came with the frame, but I just read and noticed that it doesn't. So you do have to add that. You do. And uh, Steve Gibson put his in a nice Aaron Brothers custom frame. It was a black sort of color, and it looked gorgeous. And I've seen other implementations of it that were really artistic as well. So and there's a lot of PDP-8 enthusiasts out there. And, of course, a number of PDP-8s themselves that are still working, like the March mm -hmm. Group has a couple of them. And uh, I've seen one up at the Living Computer Museum in Seattle, but they're very expensive these days. It used to be you could get one kind of on the cheap, but no longer. They go for yeah. thousands now on eBay. So anyway, that's that project. I thought it was cool and uh, hope even that I'll be able to get Bob, the uh, creator of this, on a podcast episode. We've had a couple emails go back and forth and hopefully we'll be able to carve out a time to chat. And also, if you when you, if you talk to him, or when you talk to him next, Earl, would you ask him about, does he have any plans on re-releasing, updating um, his other kit, which was the, um, the, the Cosmac Elf? The Cosmac, it is one of the, it's one of the topics that we uh, emailed back and forth on when we were talking about the podcast. So I, I could only think that he would, I don't know how many he sold, how well it did, but I would only think it could do better now. Yeah, well, again, that would depend on availability of the RCA, what was it, the 1802 yeah. chip that went in there. And I think I've seen those on eBay available, so I think you could probably source some of those chips, but I don't know what other components are in that kit. That kit is a I little simpler. It's, you know, that single board <laughs> sort of scenario. It looks it looks almost like the MicroKim, yeah. actually, in its mm -hmm. construction. Mm -hmm. I have one. <laughs> you have a, you have one of the Cosmac? Yeah, I actually built it at um, the only VCF I ever went to in California in 2006, and so uh, oh so wow, the a, same the same time that cool. you did your, your replica replica one. one. Yeah, I signed up for both of those. <laughs> nice, very nice. Can you so show cool. that on the show and tell sometime? Because I'd I'd yeah. love to see that. I'd love to sure. see it as well. I have Absolutely. to go. It's in a box out in the garage. Oh, but yeah, gonna... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you you go right yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So, David, um, before we get to the next bit of news about Sega, oh, yeah. I, I'm interested in how are the comments going. Has anybody else commented on the topics we've talked about so far, um, either this bit of news or about their first computers and that sort of thing? There how's has our, been some. Audience? Hit me. So, uh, Rand Randall K. Randy said that his first computer was uh, just after he graduated from college, and it was a TRS-80 model, and the, the base system, 4K RAM, 4, 4K ROM. That's enough. But then he went on to get his first computer, and it was an Atari 800. Oh, What a nice. great machine. That's a major years. step up, too, in, in processing ability. Yeah, that's what I said. It was a nice upgrade. Mm -hmm. um, and then KH KeySynth75, K, anyway, <laughs> and that's his real name. My first computer was an Amstrad CPC 464 and had it for years. So that tells us where, uh, well, he or she may be. Yep. Um, and, and those she, were nice machines too. Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a great first one. And then uh, Christopher just said this first machine was the Timex Sinclair One Thousand, and the spiritual first was the C sixty four. And uh, I bet you it's a C sixty four for a lot of people. I bet you that was a lot of people's introduction to like a fully featured computer that you can at easily attach a, a smart hard drive to and that kind of stuff. I bet you that's the spiritual one for a lot of people. Between yeah, sixteen sure and twenty five million, huh? I'm jealous that that. That uh, he or she had an Amstrad CPC, though the last yeah. commenter, like that's a such a unique form factor. Like that's such a unique first computer. Like that's fantastic. I and love, one more I love is grumpier than now had a uh, or at school used a Bell and Howell Apple II Plus. Oh, nice! Went the 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 black one, the Darth Vader Apple II. Very cool. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, wait, one last comment, and I'll, I'll hand it back over. So Christopher just said, I have nightmares about membrane keyboards to this day. <laughs> about the time X Sinclair won the prison. <laughs> I had one of those. I had a ZX81, I think, um, was really the only membrane computer I, I personally owned. Um, but yeah, what a, what a nightmare of a tiny. And, I, and the thing <laughs> yeah. is, I, with that one, I had a printer that went with it that was one of those little printers that just took a tiny spool of paper. It was like a cash register printer. And I'd print out stuff on that and, and uh, right. so tiny. And then I had a similar printer that used the little rolls of paper for my Coco. I had a Tandy Coco and I had one of those. And the Coco was something I did quite a bit of programming on. So I used to print out my um, my programs on that thing. And it was like it was little colored pens and they would go down and it would write oh, everything. Yeah. So so slow, but also little tiny printouts. So I have my cash register printouts of my program. Well and the the Timex or the Sinclair ones, weren't they um, sort of that silver coated paper? Yeah, the one I had for the Sinclair was it, was, it was almost like fax paper. Like it was, I yeah. think it was thermal. But it was kind of silvery? Works. Yeah. Really? Yeah, it was bizarre. And they would fade. Like with the, the Timex one I had, um, if you came back to your printouts like like two months later, the paper would be like, <laughs> <laughs> it was like the world's oh, worst printer. <laughs> it was just so hilariously terrible. <laughs> oh, oh, gosh, yeah. I remember, I remember spies, doing but... an essay once for the Coco and printing out my essay on that little paper stuff. And my teacher was just like, uh, no, <laughs> get a typewriter. <laughs> so I had to retype it all on a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, early computing, <laughs> things you just don't do anymore. So my mm -hmm. tiny little printers. So anyway, let's get back to the news. So uh, Sega is in the news again, at least in the news in Japan. And this seems to be, as far as I can tell, a real thing that's coming by the end of month. Sega is going to be releasing some retro gaming inspired Sega Note. Be a series of four different laptops. And there's four different covers. And at first I thought it was, you know, each laptop had one cover, but it turns out there's simply four ranges of specs you can get for the laptop. And then there's four covers you can choose from, or you can buy the set of all four covers and swap them around. So they're very similar to, I don't know if you guys remember, there used to be um, an Apple PowerBook. The, oh, I can't remember the name. And it had a, a cover that you could slide an image uh, into. Do you remember the that The 1400. One? It was 1400? Okay. So yep. that sort of idea, except these are printed covers. So you've got a cover that's like, clicks onto your your notebook and um, the high end specs will be you know pretty decent for a laptop there's core i7 uh, intel chip 8 gigs of ram uh, it's got an nvidia geforce gt 650m which i think is the, the 1 gig um, video card 120 gig ssd blu-ray burner so that's really the high end and they go down from there but what's what's exciting about these is that the the covers are based on old Sega video game systems. So there's the Mega Drive. You can get one that's inspired by the Sega Saturn, the Sega Dreamcast, and also um, just one that is simply the Sega game console. So if you're a fan of old Sega game consoles, if you uh, grew up with the Dreamcast or, or you have fond memories of the Saturn, that kind of stuff, and you're a PC gamer, these run Windows 8, then it might be something to consider. I don't have any word yet on pricing, but um, Unfortunately, because most of the news I can find out of it is on Japanese sites. Well, I just and added I one. I just added a, a, in the show notes. I just added a, an article from IGN, oh, which excellent. collaborates this. It's saying that there it's a collaboration between Sega and and e Ebtin or whatever. Who, what's that other site? The retailer. They're a Japanese retailer. Okay, I do know that these apparently will not be sold outside of Japan. So you'll have to either go to Japan to get one. Earl, you're going to Japan soon. You can pick up one of these. Or um, you'll have if to find a different If they're going to be ready by July. Uh, sure, they're coming out end of March. It looks like when they'll be released. So I just, I found it really interesting yeah, that that just you've got this nostalgia wave still building and, and um, the with the Saturn and the Dreamcast, uh, a lot of people fondly remembering those systems and that you can now get brand new laptops that harken back directly to those systems. So David, um, in, the, in the IGN article, it says uh, it's very limited editions, about 50 of each, wow. with the, uh, the low end at about $1,077, the high end at about $2,098. Okay, so that's not outrageous pricing for these kind no. of specs, but that is seriously limited. Also, I think it'd be if since Sega is Why really bother? involved in it, they're, 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 I'm sure their value would increase. But how do you make a laptop run with such limited quantities? This must be a standard stock laptop that they're simply designing. They're going to print this many covers to snap onto it. That's what it must There's be. There's no way somebody's doing a full laptop run of only that quantity. You couldn't yeah. possibly do it. And they might be doing something custom you know, under the keyboard or something very, but probably 
Yeah. There's nothing really fancy about the laptop. It's a chunky notebook. It's nothing super fancy, but it looks like any old Windows laptop. So it's really great. So it must be just that they're doing this run of covers to specifically snap onto a, a particular model. So. So maybe it's just something where you just have to get the covers. It, I mean, it's not the sort of thing that you couldn't emulate yourself or create a cover for. A lot of people use laser machines to etch into into notebook covers and, and tablets and stuff nowadays. But I just found it really interesting that uh, I've always had a soft spot for the, the Saturn in they particular. They do what? What do they do? Um, etch. Have you seen etching? Oh, get a, go, Google is your friend. You will find lots of examples of people um, uh-huh. using little laser etchers. To really? etch images into their laptops. Oh, fantastic! Oh, yeah. like, amazing yeah. designs. Really, Mostly really. A lot of oh MacBooks. my gosh! Yeah, a lot of. I gotta take MacBooks. a look at this. Yeah, yeah, David. Right, it's it's very much MacBooks uh, centered because you got the um, the uh, aluminum or mm-hmm. magnesium nowadays, or is it still aluminum? I never yeah, know it's all, it's all aluminum. Yeah, so it's easy to etch into them. You just got to make sure you don't burn all the way through. But some really intricate and really beautiful things. A lot of times integrating the Apple logo if they're if they're doing stuff on the top of it. So really beautiful stuff. So um, anyway, I just found it really interesting that Sega Sega is making a comeback. I, w- I yeah. would rather buy a buy a new Saturn. But the, the well, even though it's not a thing. even though it's not a kit, I mean, it's kind of it's well, and it's not a reproduction per se, but it's up there with the same sort of things, like the PDP-8 or the making a reproduction Altair. You know what I mean? It's sure. it's reproducing the the experience, I guess, in a new uh, form factor. And if you're looking for a, a Windows notebook anyway, and I don't think these prices are outrageous, so if you were in the market for around that time in April to be picking up a new Windows 8 notebook and these are the specs you're looking for, if it's not going to cost you a huge premium and you're a big fan of old Sega systems, at least I want people to be aware that it might be an option. It does, of course, also involve a flight to Japan. <laughs> but other than that, <laughs> yeah. it's no problem. We have to make sure and look and see after people get these Japanese people, perhaps, when, when they show up on eBay, maybe. You know, they'll oh, resell, sure people they might will. turn right around and resell them. Yeah, with some, and no doubt at a much higher price point. With that kind of limited quantity, these things will immediately mm-hmm. go on eBay for a, a premium, unfortunately. Right. So, David, next up, you have selected not just one or two or three, but four different short news things. Go, David, <laughs> hogging the show. You are not well, the host. I'm going to pick one I, of these. <laughs> so, hit, I hit these, me with your I, quick mentions. Well, and they're all quick. I had these notes, you know, that I wanted to, you know, I built up and wanted to make sure to kind of put them in the show, but I didn't want to put, you know, four different things. So, so they're all really quick. So, first, I want to read the email that we got from Terry Stewart. Hello, um, Terry one of our uh, big fans, and he spoke about, let me get there, where's his email? Okay, so he'd written us about smoking caps, you know, capacitors and all that, and he said, Enjoy, enjoyed watching the show live for a change, usually that's impossible here in New Zealand, as it's Monday morning and all of us Kiwis are at work. Luckily I'm on vacation and today it was raining, so I guess he's not watching now, because I, no. I haven't seen him in there. Um, but he talked about the caps that blew in my TRC-80 Model 3. They are sure to be filter caps on the AC line in the PSU. These old wax paper type ones, pre-1983 or so, always seem to blow, and in a most spectacular fashion, which was true. Which I've had them the go way. in my, my BBC, Osborne 1, K-Pro 2, Lisa 2, Epson QX10, probably some others I've forgotten about. They smoke well, however, they don't seem to be <laughs> critical, as in most cases the machine will just keep going with the blown ones. And he added a little bit more, but that's, that's the gist of it. So that that was interesting. I wanted to make sure to read that. And Terry um, would know. Mm-hmm. He's he's a knowledgeable fellow. Which he goes by Tez. Yes. And and he has some great uh, YouTube videos. Oh, he has some great machine. YouTube yeah. videos. Yes. We'll make sure we link to them. He's fantastic. Also, a quick mention that Mike Willigal, who uh, runs the Apple One Registry website, mm-hmm. and he has made the Apple One reproductions, um, some of them. I guess there might have been at least another person doing them. But he is now working on a Selby reproduction, and he has a video up showing the first time he's, um, he's powered up one of these. And so that's pretty neat. If you don't know what a Selby is, um, it was one of, the, you know, one of the few sort of non-microprocessor-based personal computer kits, microcomputer kits, you know, before the Altair. It's mm-hmm. like 73, 74, along with the Mark 8. With odd um, spelling for those who wanted, it's S-C-E-L-B-I for Selby. Mm-hmm. Uh, another quick mention is from our fan and who's in the forum and watching us right now, Randy Kindig. Randy, I'm saying that right, I hope. And uh, so he has a new podcast called Floppy Days, and he had uh, emailed out and mentioned it's not, he's sent it to YouTube, uh, YouTube iTunes. It's not there yet, but here's a link to it at Lisbon. So yeah. check out Floppy Days. I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. He's yeah, just got the one episode up so far, but absolutely. And great, mm-hmm. great title. I'm surprised nobody's used that before. Like, that's a really good title. 
That's very cool. I, mm -hmm. I think I remember him talking about uh, starting that up over on the Vintage Computer Forums. So yeah, right. Awesome. Yeah, about it. Always exciting. I love the fact that there's more. There's so much room for more podcasts and about retro computing, and there's definitely room in my podcast rotation for more of them. So I'm always really excited when new ones launch. Very and, cool. And lastly, not um, excuse me, not retro computer related, but um, Bruce Damer, who runs the Digi Barn, and he's a friend of the show. Been on the show one time, and uh, he started his own podcast. So he let me know this, and I just thought I'd, I'd pass it along. It's called mm -hmm. Dr. Bruce's Levity Zone. <laughs> so, so check that out. Banner. I was like, Bruce, Dr. Bruce Banner. Is <laughs> I was like, right, right, right. Like, is this a whole thing? I, I, I totally didn't understand it first, but it was finally clear when I looked at the site. <laughs> so yes, and, which uh, is at over at drbruce.org. And you can look up one of the older RCRs, and he was on it, and I could look it up, mm -hmm. I guess. But it's it's one of the, I think it's before ten somewhere in there. He he was on the show. But if you don't know about the Digit Barn, it's a it's a computer museum, and I'm not sure its status currently, but um, but he's been very involved, with, like the VCF in California and the Computer History Museum and things like that and interviewed a lot of interesting people mm -hmm. and so on. So that's it. Good mentions, all four, I say. So Earl, what about you? Want to round out our news section with something about the uh, Commodore? <laughs> I'll do it. We, we typically, <laughs> oh. you know, we, we drop talking about all of the auctions that we mentioned on the show and how they did the next mm -hmm. week because sometimes that's just boring. But I thought this one was pretty exciting. We were speculating what that Commodore 65 prototype would go for. And I think our guesses were a little on the high side. It wound up selling for $7,600. Oh, and then almost immediately afterwards, wow. I saw a posting on the Vintage Computer Forums where somebody had said, well, my car died, and so I'm going to have to sell my Commodore 65. And wow, it's crazy that you have two, two that, that quickly. Just that, and, and yeah. put it up uh, as a buy it now for 6K, and it went immediately. Right. So um, I guess Well, you can imagine, because somebody would have bid just under 7625 for the other one. They right. probably thought, oh, excellent. I was looking for one of these anyway, and so, yeah. 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 Uh, how, many know, are, both, how many are both there? Both of them were, <sighs> what, I don't know. Two. There's just a few dozen um, oh, okay. that are out there in existence, if I understand it right. And they're in varying degrees of functionality. Like, mm -hmm. I think both of these were Really varying degrees non of non-functionality. <laughs> yeah, both of these were non-functional units, but yeah. they're unobtainium in the Commodore world, so Absolutely. this is... Uh, it's kind of exciting, so I guess we can figure the market price for a good condition Commodore 65 is six thousand to eight thousand. I also, I honestly think a big part of the collective. It's you guys might think I'm crazy here, but I think a big part of the collectability of the Commodore 65 is the name. Commodore 64 is one of the most famous brands in computing, and the fact that it's the 65 instead of the yeah. 128, which really came, out, it's it makes it so clear what this thing is. I think from a branding standpoint, it has really helped its collectability. If this was called the something else, if this was the Commodore 350 XL or something, I don't think it would get this big of a big of a buy. I think it's the 65 really. I, I'm really it. surprised though. That it's that it really is that collectible or that sought after that much money when it doesn't work, I. And that's surprising to me. It really is that much money, but it's all relative. I mean, if mm -hmm. seven eight thousand dollars isn't that much money to you, then. It, you well, know. it's a lot of money to me. But, but uh, yeah. That's interesting. But yeah, I'm glad. So you think there's a couple dozen of them? I wondered, like, uh, years ago when I ever first heard of a Commodore 65, first off, I thought it was like, you know, no one had ever really seen one sort of a thing. And then maybe one or two of them out there. No, so. there, there's, I, I think that there was an effort to get a registry going of them or something like that to figure out how many Commodore 65s there were. But I don't remember what the ultimate uh, guess was. And that's a good topic. Is that you know, like that Apple One registry? We need more of those kind of things. Yes, we do. Registries. I agree. Absolutely. There's a pet Registry. registry mm -hmm. So if you guys have a Commodore pet, definitely get out and register it on the pet registry. Absolutely. And you got one, Earl? A, a Commodore pet? Yes. Have a pet? I, okay. I have one. Okay. Yep. Did good. you get it? Now what? <laughs> well, now we are going to talk about the retro computing gift idea. As host, I have Ooh. selected a gift. And while I talk about that, David, I'd like you to dip back into oh. the um, comments and take a look to see if people have comments about the news that we've talked about so far. But 
up next, the <laughs> retro gift, the thing that I'm selecting as a gift, and I usually pick gifts that I would like people to purchase for me. And <laughs> what I would like people to purchase for me is the Alan Turing Monopoly set. So Bletchley Park has uh, oh. officially launched this. It's in pre-order. It's based on a board that had been hand-drawn by William Newman, who was the son of Turing's mentor, Max, and that they played together when um, William was a kid, and William actually won. And it's a special, so it's basically it's Monopoly, just like you met, but it's a special edition version. So the squares around the board are revised, the chance and community chess cards talk life, the, uh, the instead of being houses and um, and hotels, it's huts and blocks, which were the buildings that house the Bletchley Park code breakers. So I find that really interesting. And Turing's face is on all the banknotes, so it puts them on the ten pound note, which which corresponds to the petition that's going on in the UK right now to try to get that done in real life. So I found it really interesting. I'm a big fan of Turing and uh, not a big fan of how unfortunately things turned out for him. Real shame, real tragedy. But yes. uh, great. If you're into this sort of thing, like if somebody's a gamer and you're and you're into vintage computers or you have a friend into vintage computers and you want to pick them up a game, here's something really unique that you're not going to be able to walk into a store and find. Everybody already knows how to play Monopoly, but if you're going to play it anyway, why not play Turing Monopoly, I say. I, say. I, I agree, and I wonder mm -hmm. if the purchase of this actually helps with the funding for Bletchley Park. I would assume so, because it is due Bletchley Park, and we'll have a, we'll have a link at so bletchleypark.org.uk, and it's only 30 pounds. So for a special, very limited edition Monopoly board, that's not that much money. Like, you'd think this is the kind of thing that might have ridiculously gone for mm -hmm. 99 pounds or something insane. Right. So uh, pre-order right now. I think it's coming up very shortly. You can also add a donation to Bletchley Park when you make the purchase. So, um, yeah, anyway, that, that is my choice. So we'll have a link. This will go into our ongoing retro computing gift guide, which, of course, is over at rcrpodcast.com slash gift guide, or just head to rcrpodcast.com and click on gift guide. So before we get to more things to purchase through the eBay auctions, David, tell me, what uh, the, the masses, what are they saying? the angry, angry masses, <laughs> what are they saying on YouTube right now? Well, let me just add too the because um, I looked it up the uh, the Monopoly game. So if we wanted to buy it, that is U.S. or Canadian residents, it Woo. would be it's eight pounds shipping. So it's about fifty nine. Well, I didn't look up Canadian dollars. It was like fifty nine U.S. dollars. Canadian dollars is slightly more powerful than your weak, <laughs> weak U.S. peso. Um, the extra comments we had was uh, Andy Collins had come in and said the ZX printer used a narrow reel of paper that was aluminum coated. When printing, it passed a current through the alley, burning it away, revealing the aluminum, I guess, burning it away, in a way, revealing a black layer beneath. So that's how it printed. Oh, interesting. So that is pretty neat, yeah. Um, and then uh, Randy Kendig had said the 800 was a fabulous machine. I eventually moved on to an 800 XL and stuck with Atari. Uh, when I moved to the Atari See, I don't ST. like the XL as much. The XL is like a better computer, but I don't mm. like the look of it. And for me, like so much about these old computers is the industrial design. And that yeah. original 800, like I never would really like the 400, mostly because of the keyboard, but that 800 and its keyboard and the little flip up thing, which I only found out from Earl that turns off the power when you lift it up. I didn't even know that. That's how little <laughs> I know about the 800. But I love the original 800. I just adore that form. I didn't know that about that door. That's kind of like... Hey, come look at my new Atari. Oh, I was sick. <laughs> well, I was telling Earl, I'd be programming and think, do I have BASIC in there, the ROM? Let me, let me just check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. But I guess it was a good well, idea because so you wouldn't the, get The purpose out and... was so that you wouldn't go swapping out the cartridges well, while the power on. was on, yeah. it, which destroys yeah, both exactly. the computer and the cartridge. But right. Do you uh, ever remember like when it was new? Did it maybe have a sticker there that said lifting cover turns machine off or anything like that? Oh, you only no. have to do that once. <laughs> I never saw that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's a lesson you'll but, You know, the Atari 800 and the Apple II, I think, are very similar um, very similar looks and everything about them. They the are. Keyboards. Similar sort of color, similar sort of keyboard. Mm -hmm. And that's a keyboard that I really like, that rounded keyboard from, mm -hmm. from that period of the 80s. I just love I, it. Whereas the XL has a nice keyboard. Like, I really do like the keyboard. But Atari, by the time the XL came out, was into that sort of blacker look with the silver stuff on the sides. And, yep. just didn't and those silver right. buttons didn't feel as good. Yeah. They felt kind of wobbly compared to the Better than the those nice laser angle buttons, buttons they had on the top yes. of other machines. Uh, but the, yeah. the original 800, 
I think is just one of the most beautiful computers ever. I, I adore, and I love the drive shapes, the, the yeah. little hexagon sort of drive shapes that in the little mini printer that you get beside it. The whole thing, I think, is just one of the most beautiful. Love it. Love it. And I liked all those keyboards. You know, the Lisa keyboard and then the original Mac keyboards were very similar too. Yes. And I always really liked the feel of those keyboards. You know, a lot of people go on about the early, you know, PC keyboard. And which sure, I, I've got a, a oh the a, Model M's were awesome. Yeah, I've got uh, two Model M's. One of which I use as my primary keyboard on my Mac through a little little adapter. Mm. Love it. Oh, yeah. that that buckling like spring keyboard. is great. It is. And remember, yeah. you can still buy those. I think that might even be on our gift guide. The Unicom. Yeah, I think it yes, is. Yes, it is. Buckling yeah, of course, spring. everything's in our gift guide. <laughs> So, speaking of things you can buy, nice segue, Earl. <laughs> Let's look at eBay or other auction sites and see what the three of us have selected for stuff to lay down some hard-earned cash, maybe even American money. <laughs> so, David, what have you? Oh, seen? I found something very interesting this time around. And first off, so it's an Atari Stacy two, which you know I don't know a lot about the Atari Stacy, but I really didn't know there was a two, an Atari Stacy two. So, um, that, along that news to me. So basically, and uh, Earl, you might be able to correct me. So I think this is a portable Atari 5 um, ST, basically, right? 520 I, ST. I don't know much about the Stacy. I think that's why they're calling it a uh, Stacy. So obviously, I didn't research it that much before picking this, but, but I know that they're fairly rare. It's got, as of right now, five days left. It's about $224. It's got to buy it now, $550. Um, I so it's still going to buy it now, but it's got bidder, so I guess it's got a reserve Oh, then? reserve not met. Okay. Yep, so far. So uh, it's got a lot of good pictures. It says the hard drive isn't uh, initializing, isn't working, but it, it does have pictures of, um, you know, using diskettes, shows the gym uh, environment and all that. Toss. Well, that is a very so, unique computer. I didn't know there was a Stacy yeah. 2. Yeah, well, like I say, neither. I know I'd heard of this, Stacy, and mm -hmm. again, so sort of like the 65, I thought it was pretty rare and, you know, seen in the wild and so on. Um, but we'll see how it does. I, I'm sure it, uh, I bet you it'll get the, you know, the reserve, whatever it is. And it comes with a probably. programmer's dongle, it says. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. And what about you, Earl? What have you selected? Well, I want Atari also. Mine's a little bit more pedestrian than David's pick, but the thing that I liked about this auction is if you wanted an Atari 8-bit uh, computer complete with everything you'd need to just plug in and go, then this auction would be for you. It's a 800XL, uh, 1050 talking about that. disk drive. I was just talking about how I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, a 1027 printer. Uh, uh, now, it's interesting, too, a Commodore 1701 monitor. It's not an yeah, Atari. That's, that still works, though. You just plug them in. That's a good monitor. Yeah, but the 1701, 1702, you know, those were those were darn good monitors. Mm -hmm. um, and this even has covers. It's got uh, joysticks. Uh, you know, it's got these nice Atari-branded covers on it. And it's obviously functioning. I mean, the picture that they have here, you know, one of my pet peeves is people who sell the computers and they go, I don't know yeah. if it works or not. I don't you know how to test it. I'm like, you don't have a television. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Come on. Plug what? into I wall think. and turn on. Yeah. yeah. It was a nice looking system as far as like uh, everything matching up and just looks very refined. I think Excel did look like a more professional. It looked like a business computer, you know, like something you could, yes, I am a professional business person and I am firing people every day or something. <laughs> so you'd have that with your XL. And here, the, the XL, the 1050, and the 1027, those are all same era. So if you're talking about look and feel, they all match. The mm -hmm. only odd man out here is the, the Commodore monitor. I like the cover, but, the dust covers in particular. Very cool. Yeah. Really so unique. anyway, and the price seemed reasonable for all of that for a working, and when I looked at the pictures, the close-ups, it looked like everything was in good shape. So no bids at the moment, uh, but it just, uh, this, this auction just started six days, 19 hours left. $129 opening, or you can do the buy it now for 200 and the shipping was um, I'll take it. 99, which isn't bad when you consider that boxing all of this stuff up and shipping it is going to be both heavy and big in mm -hmm. terms of the boxing. So uh, I, I thought this was a, a nice pick. Good choice. I agree. So my pick is something that I spotted a couple days ago and I thought might be gone by now. So I had bookmarked it just in case and it's still there with no bids and I don't get what people are seeing that I'm not seeing because I don't see why this is no, has no bids on it. I am selecting a still sealed copy of VisiCalc, the PC version. So it's VisiCalc for DOS for your Atari 
XT or your um, IBM XT computer. So <laughs> Char- if you're a collector, yeah, if you're a collector for old software, I mean, this is the you know very popular edition of VisiCalc from 1982. It's still completely sealed, so it's you know highly collectible. You don't come across a lot of still sealed versions, and the opening bid is forty dollars. Um, has a buy it now for a hundred, which itself I don't think is an outrageous price. But I'm really surprised that nobody has ponied up a single bid for forty dollars. There's still five I days totally left agree. in this auction, but I'm yeah. really surprised that nobody. I'm and I kept looking like, what are people seeing that I'm not seeing? Because no, it's a good seller. It's got six hundred percent feedback with sixty things. It's not outrageous shipping. At least for me, it's twelve fifty. I don't know what it is to the U.S., but. I think it's, it's, it's in good shape. It's still shrink wrapped. It looks to my eye like original shrink. You really have to watch shrink wrap stuff on on the net because it's so easy to re shrink wrap something. But this looks like original well, shrink. But look at the sticker on top of the shrink wrap. Yeah, that, that's hard to duplicate. I think you so could, too. You like, could do it, but I mean, and it's um, and it's shrunk in in a way that seems period authentic. The yep. way the shrink wrap would shrink. Like it just it seems to my eye this looks authentic. It's forty dollars. It's the you know much. Well, it's not the original, original VisiCalc, go Apple. Right. It, it is, I think, in a lot of ways, a more useful version of VisiCalc. <laughs> like it's so mm-hmm. um, crazy that this thing has no bid. So anyway, I'm selecting this thing, and I think it's funny that nobody has ponied up uh, $40 to buy this. I think yeah, I totally don't get it. I think it's I think a total that, steal for this. I think the thing hurting it, if, if you will, is that it's not for the Apple II. That would make, uh, oh, that sure, would make yeah. It if you're the, collecting you know, VisiCalc, then absolutely for the Apple too, like, and God knows what they would go for a heck of a lot more than forty bucks. So, if you're a PC collector and you like old software, and you just, you know, some people collect that stuff. This is a, you know, a, a major edition of a very important piece of software, still mm-hmm. sealed from 1982, going for forty dollars. Not a lot of software you can get that's this important. You can get still sealed for forty bucks. So, and I think it's steel. Yeah. I have it. I don't have all. I have is the disc, but I have a, I have right. the functioning VisiCalc, this one, you know, for the PC. So well, you and you can, I believe that you can freely download it as well. I think I mean, Dan mine's Brooklyn, the actual, the real thing, but I just don't have any of the, 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 the packaging. The disc. Right. Yeah, I mean, you get the packaging, and, and plus the shrink the wrap, too. Now, of course, I would, I would buy it, and I would de-shrink wrap it. I would defrock totally. it. Believe know? me, and I but, love doing that. I almost bought the thing. I don't even want the PC version, but I just love to open old <laughs> software. Oh, I love um, it so much. Get that old software smell. <laughs> totally. Just adore it. So those are our three auction picks. Now, uh, let's wrap things up with a bit of closing discussion. David? Closing. David, David, David. Is it something to do with a museum? Are you starting another museum? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not starting a museum. I'm running a big computer show, though. Sort of. I've heard about that. So actually, yeah, I wanted to mention. I think I got uh, so, something like seventeen tweets about that. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, some more VCFSE that that rolls off the tongue, you know. Um, news and, and SE stands for Special Edition, by the way. I pronounce it Vicky Views. <laughs> <laughs> but after the show last time, I guess it was two or three days later. It must have been the Monday or Tuesday. I don't know. But anyway, I launched a Kickstarter campaign. This was something I'd been planning, and so. We hit our goal just in a couple of days. You can have but... a podcast soon that's not another Kickstarter campaign. <laughs> You'll just keep doing them. Well, and it's my Kickstarter. I mean, I'm running it, but it's not my Kickstarter. And it's, it's already for, been it's funded. Show. Yeah. So, yeah. but you know, the trick. So, here's some advice. You know, when you run a, this is to me the most important advice. When you're going to run a Kickstarter, you want to uh, have have a. You want to make your goal the lowest possible goal you can make, where you can achieve what you need to do with it. You know, so you can meet it. So, so you can only I go agree. higher. So, some people say, you know, do that and then have stretch goals for right, right. Uh, more deliverables. But yeah, yeah, be be as reasonable as you can. That's a good idea. So the Kickstarter still going. In fact, it's got two more weeks to go. We met we met the eight hundred dollar goal. It's at eleven hundred fifty six right now. Um, can you still get in and get a T shirt if yeah, you want to? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Or a ticket. There, it's unlimited availability on that. You know, after this is done, nice. then we'll order the T-shirts. So, because uh, I gotta say, those were nice-looking T-shirts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, green. I'm very happy with them. Uh, Dan Roganti designed that for us, and he has done. Uh, it's funny if you look in the Kickstarter, the picture of me, I'm wearing one of you know a VCF East T-shirt that he designed. Oh, I had uh, spotted that. VCF nice. East from uh, 2009, I think. Nice. So he designed that for us. And, and what's the um, computer you're holding in your Kickstarter photo? Oh, that is. I'm holding a board from the uh, the Altair that was built into a desk. Oh, sure. Got so it. that's the uh, ah. without zooming in on. I think it's a processor or it's RAM, something like that. Right. One of the few boards. Cool. Um. Anyway, so what you're doing? So, uh, 
the T-shirt for us to make T-shirts have some for sale. And all, that that presented a fairly large, um, you know, amount of money we needed up front, about thousand bucks. So that's what I thought the Kickstarter would do is help us fund that right off the bat. We could we can pre-sell some and afford to print enough and have them for the show too. And then we're also pre-selling some tickets, so it's a fundraiser um, to help us have enough money to run our side of things of, for the show. Um, we're we're doing the whole exhibit hall with the tables and and people are going to pay for their exhibiting, but it's just there's going to be lots of unforeseen things that we have to pay for. So mm. this is making that making sure that we we have the money to do all that stuff. Very cool. So you still get in, get a T-shirt or or pre-buy a ticket, and that's it, really it. And I saw Business Insider had a little article about you and yeah. So that just happened this morning. The and museum so want, that just won't die. Well, and what's funny about this is so. So check, check out the article. It's amusing. It's called, Apple Wouldn't Give Its Blessings, So Two Guys Build an Apple Museum on Their Own. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That'll show them. Uh, that's, that's not exactly what's happening. And, the, and, and So that didn't come out of my mouth that way. But it's still and, – uh, and there's a picture of me and there's a picture of Lonnie Mims, who's mm -hmm. a big collector here in town. And he's the guy doing the, the – uh, the Apple pop-up museum, which is right. the big major exhibit. Which is a great museum. idea. I mean, honestly, as much as I make fun of it, that's a great idea to have it <clears> at <throat> Vicky Fuse. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, like I emailed Lonnie this morning, go, look, I hope you just won't upset you that this isn't exactly the, tr you know, but listen, no press is bad press and it's kind of, you know, gets attention. Sure. It's a big thing. Well, the media, the media loves angst. I mean, they love the Sturman drawn, you know, yeah. so that mm -hmm. that's why they would present it that way. Right. You don't have a whole lot of control when you start talking to the media. They kind of, you know, do their own thing. But it's but good she, that they're getting the word out there. She's the editor of Business Insider, Julie Bort's her name, real nice woman, and she's interviewed me before and, and done a couple of things like about my my idea about Apple building a computer museum. I'll go ahead and use that term. But I just want to read something real quick. And uh, But that was the angle that I, I presented to her. Hey, would you maybe cover this? And you could – so here – get to the email. This is the angle I had said – Oh, here it is. Is that, uh, yeah, you know, what about this humorous angle? You know, this guy has written articles stressing that Apple should consider building a visitor center and gallery of their history at the new Apple campus, too. They won't do it. But his friend, computer collector extraordinaire Lonnie Mims in the Atlanta area, said he'd build a whole Apple museum for the Vintage Computer Festival. So that was really my pitch to her. And so, you mm -hmm. know, you can read it, the article. That's, what, that's how it turned out. And you know what? That's a good lesson for people out there trying to promote stuff. Like, I've done a lot of PR for various companies and that kind of stuff that my family's had and also on behalf of other companies. And you have to give an angle and you have to make yeah. it as easy as possible. It's crazy how many times people yes. make the promotion to try to get somebody else to write about it more difficult than it needs to be. You've mm -hmm. got to make it like news, not not and make it have an angle and, and do as much as you can to sort of write it for them and you will get people to pick up this stuff. It's, people should take that to heart if you've got a product or an event or software of mm -hmm. your own that you're looking to promote. Is David, you, you totally took the right approach this time. And, and that's what a press release is for. And we, mm -hmm. there was also some other coverage I was able to get right after the show two weeks ago, like around the 5th or something, and um, I sent out a bunch of press releases. And that's, you know, and in a lot of the cases, they're grabbing the stuff right out of the press release sure. and just putting putting a little bit of extra stuff in there, you know, jazz it up some and, and publishing it. Absolutely. So, that's um, how it's always done. Absolutely. So I think the press, next wave should be so. you guys should sue Apple over this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then you'll get right. some real press. <laughs> so Earl, what about, uh, what about you? What have you got uh, going on in Earl land? What am I doing? I, I had a flash thought that turned out to be a lot of fun. Uh, there's a uh, local Commodore users group, and I called up the, the guy who runs it, Greg, and I said, hey, you know, why don't we do like a little session each time, each month, about a different programming language? And he thought, wow, that'd be fun. So we did our first one this last Thursday. We talked about a language called Oxford Pascal for the oh, Commodore like 64. It, yeah, pa th this particular Pascal was interesting because it used the basic line editor. So you actually put in line numbers, but type Pascal instead of basic and then run it and it'd compile it and do its thing. And it was, it, the thing that's interesting to me, if you're doing any project of consequence these days, programming for an 8-bit, you're probably going to write your program on a modern PC and then mm -hmm. use some sort of cross compiler or cross assembler. But <laughs> That wasn't the case back in like the 80s. Yeah, CC65 or something like that. Exactly. Right. But, I mean, back in the 80s, you probably didn't have a bigger computer. Maybe you did, but probably you didn't. You just had your 8-bit. So if you're going to program, you were going to use a language that was on the platform that you had. And I've always found them fascinating how the different language implementations uh, 
kind of wrap themselves around the machine that they were running on and mm -hmm. how you what kind of editor you used and what features it had and so I, I thought gosh we've got these to burn because there are probably dozens of these different languages so sure, totally. we we covered Oxford Pascal uh, like I say this last Thursday next time we're going to do Turbo Pascal for CPM which runs on the Commodore 128 in its CPM mode and I even found a library out there of some graphics routines that will let you run Commodore 128 graphics still while you're in the CPM mode on the oh, Commodore cool. 128. Nice. So, cool. yeah, it, it's... I don't have it's, a lot of um, Turbo Pascal experience. I did a lot of Turbo C. Um, but my Pascal experience, most of that was early Macintosh programming. I didn't really touch Pascal for the Apple II at all and when it came out as an OS and a language. But I did a lot of early Macintosh programming and had the, you know, the big white programming books um, and so much of that was oh, Pascal, the, so I did tons the inside of Macintosh, inside Macintosh, Macintosh, yeah. right. uh -huh. the big one learned a program, here's 90 pounds of reading material. I know, so, um, it was daunting. Yeah. So I did was a that... lot of Pascal, but all for early early Mac was my Pascal, and really nothing outside of early Macintosh for Pascal. Was that, well, I, lo was... I love Pascal because it's the language that I used in college. I mean, mm -hmm. it was so much better fan. than... I liked Pascal on the Mac. I thought it was a great operator. I, I really enjoyed programming in that. It was better than basic for learning because it had real data structures and real pointers and you could do linked lists and I learned and, a ton. There's a ton of yeah. there a ton of programming techniques and programming ideas that I cut my teeth on with Pascal on the Mac. So I learned a lot about procedural stuff for the first time doing it on the Macintosh and, and learned a lot about using libraries. All that kind of stuff was new to me when I when I became a, a Mac programmer. So mm. hey, I got two questions. For that. Yeah. Two got questions. So first so first, Earl, so Turbo, that was all Borland, right? Turbo Pascal and Turbo Borland all that. International. I, another thing that I loved about the Borland products was, first, they were cheap. Mm -hmm. And the second is they had a really sensible license agreement. They said that you can treat this software like a book. So if you have three different computers you can, that you have, you can load it and use it on all three as long as you're only using it in one place at once. Yeah, just like exactly. a book that you would, you know, do that. And so that was beautiful. No copy protection. Hmm. The the version that I'm talking about is on CPM, but I've also got Turbo Pascal 3.0 that I got off eBay for DOS. Mm -hmm. And it had some great graphics libraries and others. I, I always loved Turbo Pascal. And and then Carrington, the, um, did you have you ever heard of if you did Pascal? I'm, I was never a programmer, so. But um, did you ever use TML Pascal on uh, the Mac? You ever heard of that one, TML? Oh, it doesn't even ring a bell. Or, well, it was. Uh, I used to work for a company in Jacksonville, Florida, and they um, and they made TML Pascal, and um, it worked. I know what was the other the Macintosh work or work box or something or the programming box or Macintosh programming workshop or uh, work yeah yes. that's it yeah. so I think it worked with that but it was it was a product that the company made early oh on sure right and yeah and you could use that it. to develop a lot of things including um, uh, programs where MBW could be used for like working for the the 2GS and stuff so that's but the example. guy uh, it was Literally named after the, the main programmer Thomas Leonard and I guess his middle initial was M TML okay Anyway, that's all another no, but story. I'm, but I'm totally not familiar with that. I mean, I I did a lot of the MPW stuff, absolutely. Um, so it's quite a bit for for different things. So, um, but TML doesn't ring a bell. Uh, okay. Ah, that rocks. <laughs> <laughs> so really interesting, Earl. That and that's that's a great idea. So what was the um, you're doing it for a users group? Was it what? Just so people know, like what is the uh, oh, it's the the PDX Commodore Users Group, which you can find info at pdxcug.org. Okay. And I believe that the some of the future sessions, they're actually going to make videos, and we're going to put them online. So. Oh, very nice. So people that aren't in the Portland area can still sort of get involved with. Can the, see that's exactly the idea. So when Fantastic. we do that, I'll I'll make sure to get a link up on our show notes of that. Hey Earl, they went to um, VCF Midwest. We think they'll, they'll, they'll come on down the southeast BCF. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Greg, Greg travels across so, that country. He, he travels around. I mean, there's a annual uh, Commodore show uh, called Comvex that oh, happens yeah. every year in uh, July in Vegas, and that that's okay. a big one for the Commodore world. So well, I, cool. I don't know that'd if you cool. can make it to the to your show, but that'd be fun. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. I think that about wraps. Oh, yeah, I was going to mention that I have launched a YouTube channel, Monster Feet TV, sort of the video 
uh, oh, cool. video sister channel to the audio podcast I do at monsterfeet.com, mostly because I wanted to stick up a couple of videos. There's a, two shows launching soon that will really be just uh, video playlists at the Monster Feet TV channel on YouTube. Um, I, but I just I needed some content there, so I stuck up a quick video about the uh, Fix of Felix Jr. because a lot of people were interested in that, so I threw up a video a couple of days about that. And I have another video going up today where I open up and I and I filmed all the inside of it, so you can see how Disney put put the uh, system together. So that'll that'll oh, go up later nice. today. So and that's just over at YouTube.com/slash Monster Feet TV, and we'll have a link in the show notes as well. So that's where you'll see launching in. It was supposed to be last November, but thanks to no quarter, it's been moved. So it looks like it'll be now first or second week of March will be um, uh, uh, 8-Bit Archaeology. And so that's a, the first of the two video shows I'm launching. So, But we'll have links. I'll talk about that when it finally does six months late actually launch. So we'll see. Uh, but not a lot of news. I've got some stuff for show and tell, but not a lot of uh, other news going. Other than I'm building another main cabinet, which will go between those two piece behind me. So that should be oh up my gosh. by I next week. I think you're such a stand by... Guy. <laughs> you have the bug, and you've been bit. I have been bit, and mostly uh, I just want to play some other games. And for no quarter, like it just it really motivates me to have a good machine that I can kick Mike's butt at. <laughs> <laughs> so my competitiveness has uh, motivated me to build a great, a great main character, Very good. A great action, <laughs> just so I can hey, beat it, Mike. In closing, if I if I can add, um, just yes, you before... can, pseudo host. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier before the show, um, we walked over in our neighborhood because we've been renting ever since we moved here. So we're looking to buy a house this summer. So hopefully we'll we'll be closing on a house and uh, and hopefully one with a basement. Right along, I have to have stuff in the garage. I'll have like a nice work area in the basement. And I really want to buy a stand-up arcade machine. I mean, that would be a little later on. Or build a main machine if you're only going to have one. MAME offers you to have a lot of games in just one space. So I might be needing some of your advice. I I think I talked about this this show or maybe on No Quarter. At at Kansas Fest this summer, that's going to be my presentation. We're going to be building a MAME computer or MAME system from scratch in 30 minutes. I think you said that on No Quarter. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so we'll be able to talk about that so people at the show, if you're interested, and you come down to Kansas Fest, uh, I'll be there to sort of help people and show, we'll, we'll assemble one together that I can, uh, you'll give people advice on where you get stuff and how to wire it up and that kind of stuff because it's way easier than it. How are you going to get it think. out of Kansas Fest? I'm going down by motorcycle, <laughs> so how am I even going to get the parts down there? This is all stuff for me to work out later, whatever. <laughs> I'm going to basically come down with boards and bits strapped to the back of my Harley <laughs> as I drive down there, so we will see how much of that gets to Kansas. I'll work it out when I get there. Yeah. It might be a very ugly minimalist cabinet. <laughs> so we'll see. So anyway, that brings us, I think, to the end of this show number 45. No. That's a wrap. Uh, uh, our next show will be coming up on Sunday, March 3rd. We do this every second Sunday. So remember, you can always join us live at 1 p.m. Pacific or 4 p.m. Eastern. You can find a link over at the, our, our website, which is rcrpodcast.com. And that's where you'll find links to the show notes, where you'll find links to the forum, ways to interact with us, send us email, all that kind of stuff on Twitter. Twitter. You can find us at RCR Podcast. And of course, you can always send feedback and audio files and whatever you'd like to get in touch with us at by email at feedback at rcrpodcast.com. And if you have a moment, we'd love it if you could review us on iTunes. That really helps us get great placement. And until next time, my fellows, Retro Compute! Thanks for joining us. See you next time. So, uh, we know we didn't dip into it, but is anybody else... Oh, I should stop recording. But uh, any other comments that we should address? Hello, people in YouTube land. Um, I just stopped recording, too. Um, Let's see. Randy was saying... I'm trying to get back over there. Randy was saying he uh, was buying his tickets to VCF, so that's cool. So, get to meet Randy. And, um, oh, Grumpy Earth Thou said, and also a cabinet to just plain kick. Right. <laughs> oh, and he also anyway. said M- MPW, I guess referring to that was the Macintosh programming yes. workshop, programmer's right. workshop, right? Um, and uh, Randy also said, like Earl, he uh, when he worked on his master's in computer science, they used Pascal. Cool. Oh, and also, is this programming language discussion part of a new podcast? I think maybe he missed a part. He said that was at your your uh, user group. Yeah, that was at the the club meeting. But it might be the kind of thing we would discuss here on RCR when we talk about um, we'll have that show topic each time where we kick off. That's the new thing at the news. So that could be something we talk about. Programming and programming languages and that kind of stuff. Um, 
So two of the three of us have been programmers for a living, yeah. so we can talk about that. And, and David, you can just nod your head. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. All oh, right. <laughs> I've yeah. heard of BASIC. Yes. <laughs> so we can talk about that sort of thing. And plus, I'll be launching another podcast that the three of us talked about. I guess I can share with our, with our um, listeners. There'll be another one coming soon. That's sort of a nostalgic tech podcast. We'll have a large range of rotating hosts. Um, and that's just the sort of topic that we would talk about, the early programming languages and that sort of stuff. So we might address it on that one as well. That doesn't have a name at the moment, but I've been talking to people who will be on it and hoping one of them can come up with a good name. Who knows? Hey, I've so got you guys, uh, what, sorry, show what? and tell and that kind of stuff. I got show and tell. I got hexagonal show and tell. This isn't much of a show and tell, but uh, you know, it seems like every job I've had in recent years, I always end up finding a, a, an open package of diskettes, and mm -hmm. not one computer in a place has got a disk drive, so I think it's okay that I took it. <laughs> I, I, I think so too. Yeah, I usually take them. So here's a brand new pack. Of, yeah, they're not that old. I guess they're HD. But I like them because see, these are the color ones. Ooh, Ooh fun. So that's kind of neat. Uh, brand new pack. Three and a half inch floppies. That's too yeah. much data. Also, I wanted to mention I saw a classic movie last night um, that I, I really enjoyed. It's dated, but it's still fun. Is Hackers. 1995. Oh my god! Oh, Have you seen yeah. that lately? Oh, uh, seen that movie recently? It's no, pretty I, I, look, I actually looked <laughs> yeah. it up on Netflix uh, yeah. to see and whether they had it. They don't have available. it on streaming. Yeah, it's available on YouTube, sorta. Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> sure. oh okay. <laughs> it, it was. I, and we were watching. Know, the we were, funny thing is, sometimes on YouTube now, do you, you guys know YouTube rents movies occasionally, no. depending on the, uh -huh. the title? Like I had looked up Pirates of Silicon Valley on YouTube and you could rent it really cheap on YouTube so that I found that fascinating mm -hmm. well we watched it on YouTube and it, and it was done back when there was a 10 minute limit time limit which isn't a big deal to me it takes you had to watch a whole bunch of them watch five seconds to switch over but the yeah. weird thing is it was in decent quality we're watching it on our 37 inch flat screen in, in there right. and um but then when we got to part five all of a sudden there wasn't a part five from this one person it's like what see so then we found why another movies available legally and cheaply will always be this sort of thing because like i'll <laughs> happily spend two dollars and i'll have to put up with that crap well, then we found another you know somebody else and found that part and then went back to the better one and <laughs> well, we watched the whole movie which but didn't it, disturb all that to avoid the two dollars of getting no it no it wasn't that it's just we you know <laughs> well, we used to have Amazon Prime, so that was another option. But um, I haven't updated that again because we don't we don't buy enough from Amazon or watch movies enough to pay eighty bucks. Yeah, I've got the Hackers uh, DVD, and yeah. the last time I watched it was be a couple of years ago. But I remember thinking, oh, that's the problem with tech movies, man. They're yeah. uh, talking about hacking the Gibson, and they're talking about um, <laughs> look look at how much this got. A mega RAM or whatever. I was like, oh, you got to be much more vague when you're talking specs because it just dates it. They're they're looking at that little. What is it? Uh, I think she's got a a, a Mac Duo. It looks yeah. Like. Um, and just yeah. The, the laptops are like this thick. Oh, it's hilarious. <laughs> Tiny little screens and yeah. using the. Uh, but I mean, it's fun. I love that kind of movie. But I never at the time when I watched the movie the first time and when I watched it later, I never once bought Angelina Jolie as a hacker. Just <laughs> yeah. No. I will so maybe. I forgot the other comment, as I say, about it was, uh, oh, why was there so much uh, skateboard culture in that movie, though? I didn't get that. You don't understand, man. <laughs> you don't understand our ways. Yeah. We're cool. We're leaks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember laughing at them at the time. Thinking, yeah, you're 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 so you're so awesome, dude. Whatever. So, Earl, what have you got for show and tell? What did you bring for the class? What? Well, okay, just one thing. A book, and this is a cool series of books for the Commodore 128. This particular one is on CPM because huh. that's what I was talking about with. Turbo I've seen Plus. that book before. Yeah, but um, these guys, you know, Abacus Software, uh -huh. they made a bunch of cool stuff for the Commodore 128. Cool software and cool books. This is a series of books. There's like, I think, one through nine. Come on, show up there. See the number eight? Yeah. So you can get this whole series. And um, lots of great information. Abacus, a.k.a. Databecker, um, here. They were uh, really cool stuff. Actually, and you guys made me think of something else. So give me just one second. Hello, YouTubers. Come back. So, David, what's in the comments? He's got to go to potty. <laughs> You're our commenter. Uh, would love it to be a podcast. 
Haven't picked a hotel yet, Randy. That about would be a good podcast, there. wouldn't it? Though the idea of a podcast well, that I just think... talks about old development environments, old development languages. Uh, that would be a really. Inter- I would yeah, listen. I, think so. I would listen to that podcast. A podcast about retro programming. Is there one? I don't think there even is one of those. No. Somebody and should. And also, I think that's that. a large majority of people involved in this hobby. Oh God, yeah. Somebody should. So, and that would be a fascinating podcast to talk about old programming, environmental programming languages, all that. I would, I would subscribe in a heartbeat. Somebody should do that podcast. Ooh, Earl, what do you got? This is uh, Lotus One Two Three Revision One A. So we we're talking about VisiCalc. This is, is that the a Canadian thing. Is it Revision One A? <laughs> yeah, that's right. This is the version of One Two Three that basically, unfortunately, ate VisiCalc's lunch. Ah, uh, right. So. I've Why is got, that? You know, um, because it like blew VisiCalc out of the water. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I was thinking. I was, right. the, I was never was a fan the, of one, two, three. This was the uh, killer app, though. For yeah. The PC. So anyway, got the nice binder and everything. A buddy of mine in Canada gave it was me this. released as uh, VisiCalc un deux trois. A one a. That's it for me in the show and tell. I have hexagonal game action, baby, for the Apple II. I finally got myself a copy of Centauri Alliance. Um, what is this? This what was is, this game? is not it a super rare game. game uh, Broadband. It's kind of like it was made by the same guy oh, who, I have made, that. who made um, uh, Bard's Tale. So think of it as kind of Bard's Tale in space. It's six sided because there were six. Uh, I haven't played the game yet, but supposedly six. Uh, different species, so humans plus five others, and you you put mm-hmm. together uh, a group. It's a it's a an RPG, but an RPG in space. So Bard's mm-hmm. Tale with spaceships and stuff. And one of the neat things is you can import your characters from Bard's Tale, from Ultima, that kind of stuff, into this, and it turns them into like space characters. So That's it will fun. change That's their their stuff they have to make them into space people in different races and stuff. So I found that very interesting. I have I have been looking for a copy. To, it's This is for the Apple II. It was on a diff- couple of different platforms, but I'm really an Apple II gamer guy. I have been looking for a copy of this thing for years. It comes up on, on eBay fairly rarely, uh, fairly regularly, but always goes for crazy money and way more than I'm willing to spend. So I always bid and I always lose. And I finally pick one up for, for cheap. So I'm very, very happy. So the box isn't in great shape, but it does seem to be complete and it boots. So I'm really happy and really excited to play it. Congrats. Yes, I can't wait. Cannot wait. Really excited. I love this kind of... Uh, I'll show people the, the back of it. I love this kind of RPG. So it's just my sort of thing. So really, really, really excited. Actually, the inside comes with the, the usual bits. And bobs and books and manuals and some sort of postery thing and stuff. And Yeah, really, really excited. You know what I'd love to play sometime... Um, there were a group of, of games from this publisher, SSI. Oh, sure. Yeah, I've got a couple of those. And they were war game-type mm-hmm. simulations. And at the time, I wasn't in interested in, in war strategy yeah. and stuff like that. But, uh, uh, well, yeah, I have an Apple II, courtesy of my buddy David. So if you go on eBay, there's this place in in Brazil, I think. It's this weird seller who who... Seems totally legit and has been selling for quite a while now. And constantly has shrink-wrapped copies of basically everything by SSI and a number of other big box providers. Mostly sort of more obscure games. Mm -hmm. But I don't know why this guy in Brazil seems to have 10,000 copies of everything ever made by (laughs) SSI. But it's constantly available and just like as a buy it now thing and here you go. I picked up a couple of games from him but I haven't opened them so I can't totally guarantee they're not just full of rocks. And the guy's just waiting to get caught. Um, <laughs> but it's bizarre. So a couple of really good games always has them. And so SSI stuff, you can easily get fully new shrink-wrapped copies of pretty much anything by SSI from if you're willing to bring it in from Brazil. It's bizarre. Because I think, I think they came with maps, didn't they? And with... Uh, yeah, usually, yeah. Of- usually a lot of it was done off screen as much as on for the SSI stuff. Like they yeah. were a real board game maker and sort of uh, transitioned into the, the PC stuff. Almost uh, like that. Well, not quite. But what was that game you guys were playing at Kansas Fest? I was just thinking that. Yes, which we will be playing again. Um, oh, David, can you remember what is the Kansas Fest game that we started uh, playing that will continue next? I don't remember what it's oh, called. I'm kicking myself. Oh, you were now. playing it. I guess Star you were. something. I wasn't. I was uh, spectating. Oh. Oh, oh, it's bugging me now. I can't oh, I'll remember. I'll see if I can look it up. Game, and it's a game that's sort of notor- It's a multiplayer game. 
space oriented for the Apple II, notorious for taking forever <laughs> because you have to read these books and everybody has to, like you do a move and then you it says read chapter eight of book number seven and that kind of stuff. So we started a game at the last Kansas Fest, a group of us, people yeah. who come regularly, and we will continue okay. to pick up it, the game at the next Kansas Fest. Here it is. Fest. It was um, Star Saga 1. Star Saga 1, that was it. So the uh, show notes from that. Game I've wanted to play forever. And so we started, and we all we really got in was past the intro. It took hours to get past <laughs> the intro and set up our characters, and that's what we've done so far. So now we are waiting a full year, and we will start again. <laughs> See how much we remember from our, our characters. Let's see if there's a copy on eBay right now. There often is. There's often copies of it. It's a game that's not super rare. I have a copy as well, which I'll bring um, uh, to the next Kansas Fest just in case to make sure that there's one there. First, it was Andrew uh, Malloy had brought his copy, and we were playing that. So mm-hmm. Very exciting. Did you hear? Andrew's awesome. Did you hear me, Carrington, when I said um, I have that game that you're, sh- you're showing? Oh, do you? Yes. Do you have it for the Apple II? No, it's for the Commodore. Then it sucks. <laughs> hey, now. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it was my first love. I am biased, <laughs> kind of guy I am. So I think that about wraps us up. I'll anything, hit you over the head with a pet, David. Anything we should touch oh. upon in the uh, with the group of people that are still watching in the in YouTube? No, um, I, Grumpy Earth said I think our DOS originated with SSI games. SSI oh. had very interesting copy protection as well as I recall, um, and that's a, that's about Grumpier it. Grumpier than thou, by the way, should have his own show. What's up with you not having a podcast, dude? You you yeah, no are kidding. awesome and no tons, and I would subscribe. So do something. <laughs> Just and Randy, <laughs> Randy was asking about uh, should I have any advice about where he should stay, which I don't because um, I'm not that familiar I with. I thought people were going to just stay with you. <laughs> but um, but there's a link uh, if you go to um, vintage.org, you know the site for the show. There's a link on the side lodging and. Um, and there's a link there for TripAdvisor to look up reviews, and there's some hotels listed all within two miles. And uh, interestingly, uh, there's another uh, event going on, uh, like a sci-fi conference that's at the DoubleTree Hotel, and that's completely booked. That's the, where uh, DoubleTree is, huh? That's where I'll be in full costume, baby. <laughs> it's called the Jordan Con. You guys ever heard of that one? Oh no, I but there's so many cons. They have it in different places. Is it one of the Creation Con type things, or I I don't know. I mean, I it, I know it's a science fiction. Yeah, Creation runs the big one here in Toronto, which is Fan Expo, um, which I went to for the first time last year and adored, and I'm already looking forward to going again this year, and I will be costuming myself up. So uh, what would you costume yourself as? Well, I have sketch. My family owns a few bizarre businesses, one of which is a uh, a custom metal fabrication plant. Mm -hmm. So I own a big welding company, of all things. I don't know why. I can't weld, but I own a welding company. So I'm thinking of having them put me, uh, make me a big, a big, no, a big daddy costume from, uh, uh, bio- no, oh. Oh. <laughs> 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 that would be pretty hilarious, <laughs> but no, from Bioshock. Have you guys played the Bioshock games? Mm-mm. Uh, so uh, Big Daddy and, and Little Sister are the two major characters. And the big Daddy, diver. Sort of looking, big diving diver bell thing. With the, yeah, yeah. so I could get yeah, one of those made up, I was Hilarious. thinking. It would be kind of cool to just hulk around one of that with an actual spinning uh, drill on my hand. And I've got a friend, uh, a gal, who will dress up as the, the Little Sister if I do that. So, Wow, I wish I'd had those resources because back in the day I wanted to do a Borg costume. I wanted to do a oh, homemade cool. Borg costume. Right. But, you know, the the... Like like rubber latex work you would have had to have with all the tubes and you know that stuff. I didn't have any resources to build something like that to make it look authentic. Right. But, um, so yeah, I'm thinking you got to start thinking about costume now because it's going to take a while to make something. So very key. Yeah. I'm thinking of that or maybe a good Mister Freeze because I got the head for it. So. <laughs> Why don't you go as Harry Potter? You're the Hobbit. <laughs> you got to get the accent. Right. Yeah. See, so, look, I'm I have a, a I have a magic wand here. See. Ooh, Finch man. <laughs> it's a pen. Then it's less impressive. <laughs> no, the pen is mightier than the wand. Okay, guys, time for me to go. <laughs> me if too. I'm going, everyone's going because I'm host. <laughs> All right, you guys are sending the audio over, so I'll, right? So I'll get. I it will done do it right tonight. away. And thanks to everybody in YouTube for listening. It's always great that everybody you, joins everyone. us. That is fantastic. And uh, we'll see everybody soon. All right, take care. Bye, guys. Bye. See you later.